so first, um, again, any feel free to ask any questions from all the the videos um, on the on you know all the various I/O. That it's just it's, it was a good to go through that because you know again physical I/O is actually what's connected to the PLC for real. So all these all those discrete devices that we discussed, the push button switches, um, the analog devices. You know, those are all things that are going to be physically get wired to the PLC. And then the PLC will basically take all those physical inputs and those physical output devices. And, you know, you're basically writing a program inside the PLC that will basically be the, um, the logic, shall we say, to control those things. So you'll be using your inputs to be based, you know, big, making um, logical decisions based on whatever the uh, arrangement or status of your inputs are and then turning on various outputs based on um, on that logic. So, um, and that's kind of what the rest of this class is gonna be. We're gonna finally get the programming here uh, and just kind of, you know, it's gonna be a little bit of uh, just kind of understanding, you know, what the uh, control scheme is, you know, what are we trying to do? What are we trying to control? What's the logic required to control it? And then programming the PLC to, uh, to do that task. So um, just a lot of exercises in that to get used to that. Um, so, so just uh, again, I'll pause for a second. If anyone's got a question or anything, feel free to uh, ask. All right, um, and you know, chime in anytime you want if you got a question. So, uh, just a couple of slides on PLC selection here. And so, you know, now that we've kind of gone through that discussion of you know all the inputs, you know, the next thing might be is you know if you're really kind of designing a system from scratch, uh, you know, what would be the kind of the PLC to go with. There's lots of different manufacturers, lots of different uh, sizes out there. So just kind of the kind of re reiterate this slide. I know we discussed it before, but there are kind of, you know, three main buckets that kind of put these in. Micro nano controllers, small and then large controllers. And each one kind of has its, uh, its pros and cons. The micro nanos are very small, um, very low in cost, but they're limited to the amount of IO they can handle. So that, you know, all those push button switches, outputs, you know, how many can they actually take in and control? Um, limited in the uh, memory and communications as well. So think about a small machine, like an individual machine type control or a really small application, perhaps. The uh, small controllers or, you know, mid-range might be also referred to as like a mid-range controller you know, is going to kind of, you know, straddle between the, the micro and the large. It's going to be kind of at a, at a uh, you know, more expensive than a micro, but, um, but, you know, not too expensive of a system. And it can handle a much larger amount of IO, you know, maybe a couple of thousand IO points. Uh, they have better expandability and still limited on communications, but probably better. Um, so now you're looking at, you know, maybe a machine, maybe a more complex machine or a, a system, you know, like a smaller system control. And then, you know, going up into the large uh, category, now you're looking at, of course, you know, the most expensive option, you know, 10,000 plus IO points, so very large amount of memory, very expandable, lots of communication options. So, um, you know, much larger, dis, you know, system, much, you know, distributed control. So the point of that is, you know, if you've, if you've got something that's in this, um, uh, you know, if you've got something that's a very small amount of IO and you don't see yourself ever really expanding it, you know, putting this guy on that, on that, you know, might, you know, might be, um, you know, kind of a miss. Uh, kind of a, a you know a bit of a miss um, uh, application, right? Because you're going to spend a significant about a, amount of money and put a, a very like you know basically putting a you know using a Ferrari to uh, you know just to kind of drive to the store every day type of thing, right? So you, you know you don't need to spend that kind of money. Uh, so so just it's important to understand that you know just understand the if you're designing what what you need you know kind of what you need and then picking the right. Uh, the right tool uh, for the job and it doesn't matter what manufacturer you know i have just a few different ones here but um you know again there's lots of different manufacturers of plcs they're all going to kind of have the same 
kind of a small, medium, and large uh, kind of controller to look at. So what are some of the criteria to, this, to consider? So once again, uh, the, you know, you got to understand the number of IO points that you have in your system. You, ha you just have to know that. Um, if you don't know that, then you have to get a drawing or get somebody to tell you or, um, you know, physically count. But you got to know how many, you know, again, all those devices, be it uh, analog or discrete, push buttons, switches, if they're transmitters, how many of those are out there? Uh, and then make a, make a, a, you know, complete count of that so that you can, um, you, you, you can get a, you know, a good representation of what you have to wire into your PLC. And again, the type of IO, right? The screen or analog, it makes a difference what type of, uh, type of IO you have. Um, the program size. So, you know, you might, you know, a lot of times based on the number of IO points you have, then that might help determine the, the program size. So if you have like, you know, the 10,000 IO points, you know, it's going to probably be a pretty large program. So you're going to need something that has a lot of memory uh, to write that program. Uh, communication requirements. So know upfront if you have to communicate to another system, you know, do you have to um, connect into the larger DCS system? Do you have to communicate something to something else? Um, because like we said, you know, in, in the previous slide, the, the smaller micros and the, the mid-range controllers, sometimes they don't have all the communication options available. So if you got to do something special, then that might force you to go into, um, into one particular type versus another. Type of programming languages as well, because uh, there are different types of programming languages for the PLC. We're going to really focus on one, and that's going to be ladder diagram throughout this class. That's the most common programming language there is. But there's also function block. There's structured text. So there's a few different types of languages. So if you had a special requirement for something, just make sure that that controller you're picking, you know, can handle that that language. Those languages are kind of standard. There's a I there's like a, a an IEC standard they call it. So um, so the manufacturers of PLCs, you know, they'll use the same programming language. Um, of course, every manufacturer will be a little have its own little nuances to it, but. Um, you know, ladder diagram, structured text, function block, you know, those are the standards so that, you know, that all manufacturers will support those, those languages, but not all the products in, the, in those families might support those languages. Um, physical size constraints, right? So it's, it's important to know what are you going to actually put this PLC in? If it's going into a cabinet or an enclosure, do you have enough space, right? You may not have enough space to put the larger uh, system, like that control objects in that previous uh, picture. They're just physically, it's a physically larger piece of equipment. So know your, um, just just know your, you know, your physical size constraints if you're going into an existing cabinet, especially. Expandability and scalable. Uh, do you need to, does the system need to grow, right? So maybe today, you know, it's sized for today, but what about tomorrow? Is you know, it's a couple of years from now. Are you going to um, are you going to wind up uh, you know expanding that system? And if you already know the answer to that question, if the answer is yes, well then make sure you have a, a system that can grow with you know with your um, needs. And then spare spare I/O points. So sometimes we uh, kind of along that same line of expandability and scalable. Sometimes we'll see um, requirements for so many spare IO points put in up front. So um, it, it's important to, uh, to have those spare IO points figured out. And a few other ones would be the you know, type of manufacturer, right? So you might be, uh, you're, wherever you're working, might want to use one brand over another. They might have a, a specification. So just uh, knowing that PLC manufacturer of choice, if there is one. Um, you know, it could also just be of kind of con consistency of the hardware, right? So if you already have Siemens in your plant, you most likely would want to put a, a new Siemens controller in just because everyone knows that product and you already got the software for it. Um, operator in the technical training part. So that kind of goes along with that as well. If, you're, if your operators are already trained on the uh, Allen Bradley, then throwing in a Siemens PLC is, you know, 
probably not going to help because now they got to learn a whole new a whole new thing. Uh, vendor support. Um, some vendors have uh, better support than others, so uh, you could definitely go online and and buy a PLC from somebody. Um, you know, kind of a shall we say almost like a generic. <laughs> um, in a way, but you know, if you did that, you might you might save a few dollars up front. But you know, the but does that place have good technical support? Um, it's no different than uh, like if you bought something off of Amazon. You know, if you ever try to you know contact Amazon, you know that it's almost uh, impossible to do. There really is no person to talk to. So um, so some vendors are going to be like that, where you just buy the product, there's no support, and others you get uh, really really good support. So that's a consideration to, to uh, it's important consideration. And then of course, cost and availability is also important too. So if you're looking at a small or micro uh, nano type controller, some key considerations are, um, you, know, you know, most micro nano controllers and some of the small controllers have a fixed number of IO points built into the PLC. So, um, so again, just, knowing up front what you need because once you purchase that product once you purchase that plc and you discover later that you needed a few extra io points you know there is no you know it's fixed so you have to kind of you know throw that guy on the shelf and then go buy another one so just you know we want to buy it right the first time usually um also make sure that you are picking the right the uh, voltage levels, right? Because there's a few different control voltage levels and the micro nanos are usually, when you buy them, they, they come a certain way. So it's either, you know, it's 120 volt AC or it's all 24 volt DC, but there's usually not a combination uh, of that. So, so know your voltages as well, your control voltages. Um, so again, some are expandable, so just, you know, choose based on your expansion needs if you need some, if you have some. And uh, the communications once again. So just, uh, just, just look and know what the communications options are that those, those small controllers have available to them. Uh, so the, uh, the Siemens S7-1200, that's one of the PLCs we have in, our, in the lab, you know, the City Park lab. And uh, just to show you that, um, you know, yes, you, you, you say, okay, well, I'm going to choose the, the S7-1200, but also know that, you know, there's about five different flavors of the S7-1200. There's uh, the 1211C, the 1212, the 1214, 15, and 17, and each one of these within this, this one product family has various options, right? So the 11 is 50 kilobytes of work memory, 75, 100, 125, 150, right? So it's not just, you know, knowing that this is the guy you want, but also now you got to kind of have to look a little deeper and, and see if you're picking the right, you know, um, uh, CPU version that fits in that family. So large controllers, um, you know, so most large controllers use like what's called a chassis or a rack. So you, you purchase this, uh, like this, this rack and you just slide cards into the rack or the chassis as they're also known. So, um, so that's another thing to always have to be aware of now is because you have to uh, buy a chassis or a rack size that will give you this, the number of slots available to put the cards in that you need. The, the micros and the, the small controllers usually don't have a chassis, but the, the cards kind of slide together or they kind of made up together on a piece of DIN rail. Um, so they, they kind of make a, uh, you know, they make a, a chassis in a way, but, but it, you don't slide them into a physical rack. They just kind of kind of stick together um, side by side to, um, to make that rack. But the larger controller, there's an actual chassis. So you have to just know that there's a, there's a physical size and uh, number of slots available based on what you, what you purchase. Um, if you run out of slots, well, then the, the nice thing about the large controllers is, is you can use an expansion chassis and you can kind of, uh, you know, put your IO remote and just um, run a cable to it and, and make an expansion chassis, basically. 
And then the other part about the large controllers is a lot of times you have to buy all the pieces parts separately. So the, the micros and the smaller controllers, uh, like the CPU, the, the power supply, the comm modules, a lot of times are just all built into the one into the one unit. So when you buy the CPU, you kind of get all those things um, baked in, shall we say. On these larger controllers or chassis mount controllers, you usually got to buy those each individual components separately. So you would buy the power supply separately. You got to buy the CPU separately. You got to buy the communication module separately. And then usually the manufacturers have their own uh, manuals and selection guides to help in all this too. So the other thing we have in the lab is the Allen Braille control logics. So this is the control logics is probably by far the, you know, one of the most um, installed uh, controllers, at least in this area. Uh, so there's a lot, or I should say, there's just a large control, large install base of the control logics. So by you know working with that Siemens controller and working with this control logics controller, you know you're going to touch a lot of what is out there uh, in industry. And just like the Siemens one, the control logics has a lot of different uh, options just within the family. So each one of these um, items here is a is a different CPU option. Um, there's the the L8s they call them the L8 family, which is kind of the next the, the new generation of controllers. The, these are the L7s, which is kind of the previous generation of controllers or CPU modules. Um, these are still being made, and the L8s, of course, are the latest and greatest. But you can see there's uh, several different versions, and each one has a differing amount of memory. So you know, the lowest end is two megabytes, the highest end is 32 megabytes. In the L8, we got three to 40 megabytes. So it's not just, once again, knowing, um, you know, kind of uh, how many IO points you have, but to also kind of get a feel for the amount of memory you might need, which is maybe hard to do up front, uh, but, uh, you know, but there are some tools to help you maybe estimate this because, you know, each one of these, of course, comes at a different price point as well. The, the smallest amount of memory, of course, would be the least expensive option, and that would be the most expensive option at the 40 megabytes. So just to kind of give you a little idea of, you know, what you could do, if, you know, if you're designing something from, from scratch, you know, you, you would probably be given this or you have to figure this out. But here's an example, you know, it's like a control logic system. The uh, power supply and the discrete IO modules will all be 24 volt DC, and the analogs will be four to 20 milliamp option. Um, and then, so here's what will usually you, you will be given. You'll be you'll be given like you got 64 discrete inputs, 42 discrete outputs, 19 analog in, 12 analog out, perhaps, and maybe two Ethernet modules, right? So that's that's our IO count. And from that, we can kind of uh, figure out how many cards we need to actually go out and purchase. Um, so what we have is we have, you know, this is a this is a picture of a control logics chassis, and this is a um, a 17 slot chassis. So this is actually the largest size chassis there is. The um, so the CPU and every one of these modules to its right take up one slot in the chassis. Uh, this is the power supply. And the power supply will just kind of hang off the end of the chassis. It doesn't actually take a slot. Um, but the CPU takes up a slot. These are the two Ethernet cards. They take up a slot. And in each one of these guys is an individual input card. So what's important to know is that, that each input card or output card comes with a standard uh, density, we'll call it, or size. So typically, in the PLC world, it's it's going to be tied to those powers of two, and usually it's either going to be an eight point input card or a sixteen point card, or possibly a thirty two point card. So those are the magic numbers there. Rarely will you find like a twelve point you know card or something, and they're not going to make you know one for every option. So it's usually going to be eight, sixteen, or thirty two. So if you had, you know, if you only had like the need for 12 inputs, well, you would still buy a 16 point card. You would just have like four points you just didn't use um, if you're only using 12. So if, in this case, if we had 64 in, 
and we're using 16 point cards, well, 64 divided by 16 is four. So we would need four discrete input modules. So one, two, three, four, that's these light blue ones here. And then if we had 42 discrete outputs, again, if we use a 16 point module, then we take 42 divided by 16, um, that would give us three cards, but we would have six spares on, you know, we have six points not being used. So we have these green ones, one, two, three, those are our three output cards. Then we had 16, uh, oops, sorry, 19 analog inputs. Well, it's 16 channels per module. So in this case, um, we would have, um, uh, that's obviously a typo, but uh, 16 channels. So we'd have 16 in, and then uh, we'd only be using three uh, actual points on the second card. So here we got a lot of extra points to actually be, um, uh, 16, so we 13, should be 13 spares on this second card here. And then uh, 12 analog outputs. So if, so if the analog outputs are, take a little bit, take a little bit more, um, uh, um, takes a lot more on the board to do an analog output. So it turns out that the, uh, the density isn't as large. So typically analog outputs are half of what they ever, the analog inputs are. So the largest is an eight channel input. So 12, we take 12 divided by eight, that's gonna give us two and some stuff left over. So those are our two analog output cards. So we're not gonna be doing sizing exercises in the class, but I just wanted to let, at least give you an example of what you, know, you would face, you know, if you're trying to do this, a system from scratch, if you're trying to design something from scratch, you, you know, this is how you kind of go about it. You, you get your IO count, you look at what your, your densities are on your IO cards, then you would just divide those and then figure out how many cards you would actually need in your system. Now we could also do, uh, we could actually condense that down by using 32 point input modules. You know, we could actually, you know, so before we had a 17 slot chassis. So now we could actually bring that chassis size down to 12 and uh, go with a 32 point card. So these two cards each have 32 IO points on them. These two output cards each have 32 outputs on them. So um, covers a lot more in one card. And we reduced however many, you know, inches of uh, extra space that that 17 slot chassis needed. So again, if we were physically constrained in our panel to, um, to space, you know, this solution would, would be a, a much better fit for us. Okay, so um, instead of going through these PLC wiring diagrams, um, I want to actually move on to what we'll be doing um, starting next week. And we're going to look at the, so we're going to start this class, the programming part with the micro H20. And what makes this nice is, uh, and uh, maybe, uh, maybe Monday night, I guess Monday night might be best uh, if you guys can come I know I know you're all in class um, on uh, on the West Bank, but it, if you can maybe come to the uh, City Park campus on Monday night, then I can actually give you uh, this PLC as a loaner, and you can actually do a lot of the program exercises at your house. You, you know, so all you would need to um, to do that would be is you would, you would need a computer, a Windows 10 computer that can run the programming software. It's an Alan Bradley software. The Alan Bradley software is, is free, it's unlicensed. So you can actually install it and run it, but it has to be a Windows 10 computer. And, um, it, you know, or if you do have a Mac, if you're running a VM, Windows 10 VM on it, then, then that does work. Some, a lot of people have done that before too. But it can't be Windows 7. At least not the version I have. You can run an older version and it'll work on seven. Um, so if you have an, an older machine, just let me know. We can sort through that. But uh, but if you have a Windows computer, then you could run the software. You can take this actual physical um, real PLC 
And uh, the other thing you'll need is a power supply because uh, this is 24 volt DC. So we have a power supply that can you know, take 120 volt AC in, convert it to 24 volt DC, and that will energize this PLC. So, um, so the idea would be, you know, get your hands on, on the PLC, and then we can start doing some uh, exercises on actually how to program it. And I'll show you that. I've got some videos already made too, but I'll, I'll maybe we'll do another session next week uh, that you know I can show you step by step. Okay, here's how we go about uh, you know getting the program started, how you connect to the controller, how you download the to the controller. Um, it's pretty straightforward, but there are some obviously some things that you know, if you've never done it before, you know it'll be a little challenging to figure out on your own. So. I'll show you that. If you've done any kind of Arduino programming, it might have some similar uh, feel to it a little bit, at least on the you know downloading part of it. But if you haven't done anything like that before, then don't worry, we'll, we, we'll walk you through that. So is Monday night a good, good for you guys to probably meet out here? I know you probably wouldn't get out here until, you know, maybe around this time, but uh, just show up, I can, give this to you and y'all can, um, you know, don't have to stick around at that point if you don't want to for anything. So like, that's gonna be like what we're doing for like the rest of the semester, just messing with the uh, micro one? Um, so my thought on that is, yes, yeah. so probably for several weeks, Ideally, it would be good to get you to come to the lab and work on the control logics. Um, if that's not possible, because I know we we had this class double booked, you know, because I know you have another class. Um, if it's not possible for, to get out here, then we have another workaround. I have a I have the ability to to give you a a trial license of the Rockwell so, of the control logic software. And there's a there's actually a, an emulator built into it, so we can actually do a lot of program exercises and just use the emulator. Um, but if you guys decide you want to come out on campus, you know, at eight o'clock at night and work on a little something in the lab, on you know, then that's fine too. Um, we'll kind of talk through that as we go, I think. But I think we got at least you know four or five weeks of just you know getting you comfortable with certain programming aspects, and this will micro eight hundred can really do a lot of different, you know, do a lot of things for us. They could teach us, teach us a lot about, um, you know, programming and, and plus you, it's small and you can do it at your house, which, you know, is kind of nice. Since it's a bit of an independent study class, it kind of works out, I think. But um, any thoughts on that? Or would you, you'd rather be out here doing yeah, it? I mean, that sounds good to me. Okay. Yeah. yeah I can do Monday nights. Yeah. So, um, so again, we'll, we'll and I'll, I'll I'll email you guys. But let's just plan on y'all coming out here Monday night, pick these up, and then probably Wednesday night again. I'll probably get, do like this, and we'll just spend some time. I'll show you how to do it because, you know, again, uh, you'll need to kind of we'll do like a little walkthrough, and. Um, I, well, actually, if I have a few minutes, I might do it tonight, uh, sh briefly tonight, but I know, you know, I'll do it again because it's not going to, uh, you know, it's, it'll, it'll jive better once you kind of have it in front of you. And so I think too, but um, anyway, so this is what it looks like. What I want to kind of show you is that, you know, this is the micro 820. There are different models of the micro 800 family, but the 820 is really nice because it's small. It's got an ethernet port built onto it. Um so you'll be able to connect to this thing. If you have, hopefully you got a RJ45 Ethernet port on your laptop too, or your computer. Now some some don't have that anymore, but uh, um, might be a little bit of a gotcha there too. But uh, you can connect your laptop to this thing over the Ethernet port and um, download to the you know, down, you know write a program, download to the to the device, and you know use the Ethernet port to stay connected to it. And that's when you do your kind of troubleshooting. You know, check out your logic and 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 stuff. 
the other cool feature about the uh, software too is it does have a built-in, it does have an emulator for this product too. So even if you didn't have this physical real controller, you could use the emulator and do a lot of just ladder logic exercises and test it in the emulator. But we'll have the real product. You can have the real product in your hand and uh, that always is better anyway. Um, and of course, you know, having this as a loan so once the semester's over with just you need to return the uh the micro rate 20 of course to us um they're not that expensive though they're about this is around 200 dollars. so if you really like this and wanted to buy one for yourself then uh we can always i could tell you how to do that as well um we don't have this there's a there is a little remote lcd display this was kind of designed to where you can actually put this on the outside of a panel like right? this would you know the plc typically would go in a panel behind a, a closed door so this would usually not be exposed to the um you know to the just people walking by it would be in a panel protect it but you know if you wanted to kind of have some display external to the panel for people to see what's going on then you have this little lcd display but we're not gonna we don't have that and we're not gonna really fool with this part of it um just to let you know there are there are three versions of the microwave 20. uh we're going to use this q i think the one we have is the qwb model so that basically it's a 24 volt dc input it's got four actual analog uh inputs on it which is pretty nice and it's got seven relay outputs and even one analog output so it's got you know it's it's a it's got some capability to it you know to have the the, the analogs on it as well um the uh the qbb the difference between the qb qwb and the qbb is that you know the one we have it has the has relay outputs whereas the uh the qbb is what they call the 24 volt dc output it's like a transistor output the advantage of relay output is it, it could handle a higher current being switched on, whereas these transistor output ones are usually like a half an amp. So half an amp is, um, you know, not a lot of current. It could turn on like a light or it could turn on a relay coil. The relay outputs, you know, can maybe switch something that has a little bit, you know, heftier load to it, like a solenoid or something. So usually the relay outputs are typically suitable for two amps, right? So, um, so that's kind of the difference. And the third model is basically the AC version of it. It's a 120 volt AC, um, but it's also relay out. So uh, again, we use the 24 volt version. All right, and it's got some additional specs here. So uh, if you, you, you can uh, uh, just wanna learn more about the, the technical specifications. This is on this product profile. There's a few other documents I'll, I'll show you. And, and I think these are posted in Canvas or I will post them in Canvas if I haven't done so already. So once, you know, so there are these kind of four documents would really help you, um, you know, if you're trying to really figure out something. Uh, so basically the, uh, this first one's a product profile. It's just kind of like the, uh, the data sheet, right? It's just kind of a, more of a marketing little, you know, two-page marketing thing that tells you a little bit about the product. The uh, the installation instructions kind of tells you about the, you know, as the name implies, how you go about installing it, what are some of the requirements for installing, maybe wiring. Um, so this gives you just a lot of just the uh, standards here. But then if we keep scrolling down, you start to get a little overview it kind of tells us you know right all the little things right one two three the little legend talks about what each one of these are so you can kind of get a little you know learn a little bit about the products here with what what um you know what things are kind of built into it um the status indicators so if you remember back in this we we see here we've got these little kind of um these little square rectangular things are little LED status lights that actually light up either green or amber. So they kind of tell us some status of the controller itself. This, um, this is just a little diagram of what they are. So the, the first 
this first rectangle, which is basically that one right there that I was kind of pointing to, uh, that is the, the run status. So if the, if the controller is running or not, that'll be on. If any inputs are forced or anything's forced, so you can kind of do an override if you needed to, that's called a force that'll indicate that it's that there's an override in, in effect. Enet stands for Ethernet. So if the Ethernet, if, if the Ethernet's connected, then that'll light up. If there's any kind of fault, you'll have a fault status light, communication status, and the uh, SD for uh, the secure digital card status. And then these lights up top are all your inputs. So anytime an input is on, then uh, you will that individual input will light up to tell you that it's actually on and these are your outputs so if any of the outputs are on then they'll light up and tell you the output is on so just this right here just looking at this kind of panel right here on the face will give you a lot of information about the status of the controller so we talk about troubleshooting right because part of this exercise is going to be i guarantee when you start to kind of program a little bit you're going to you know, things aren't going to always work, right? You're going to have to start to do a little troubleshooting to figure out why it doesn't work. Uh, and that's usually the best time of learning is when things don't work and you figure out why it's not working. That's, that's, um, that's just the best, the best way, right? So, um, so these status lights on the front are going to really give you, you know, even though it doesn't seem like much there, but those status lights will give you a lot of information as to what potentially could be going on uh, if you have any kind of problems. The mounting of the uh, unit. So this is kind of optional, but I do have some, we do have some DIN rail, so I can, I can give you the DIN rail because it, it does help, you know, with the uh, kind of keeping the controller a little more secure and you'll have a power supply that will have to kind of snap on the DIN rail too. But the DIN rail is just a, uh, if you haven't seen DIN rail before, it's, it's, a, it's like a metal, it's like a metal rail. And pretty much it's a universal size. So a lot of different products from all different manufacturers will kind of mount on DIN rail if it's, if it's called DIN rail mountable. And the advantage is, is you, you don't have to drill and tap holes uh, to mount this thing on, the, on a back pan. You just have a piece of DIN rail on the back pan and you just kind of snap this thing on the DIN rail and then you can easily remove it if you had to. So if, if you had to replace this controller, instead of having to unscrew it, so you see we do have the ability to screw it down with these uh, kind of screw tabs, but if it's on DIN rail, then you just kind of pop the little latch on the bottom and the whole thing just comes right up a DIN rail and you just pop a new one right in its place and um, makes that part pre pretty simple versus having to you know, unscrew it every time. But it's going to give you the physical dimension. So you can see, you know, the first number is metric. The second number is inches. So the 3.54, that's how many, you know, inches tall it is. It's four, about 4.09 inches wide. And it's about 2.95 inches deep or the height of the product. So not that, not that big. Um, so really, again, nice, nice, uh, nice program, a nice PLC. Um, that's what I work with at home won't take up too much space on your desk. Um, optional micro SD card slot, we're not gonna really use that here, but it, you could use uh, an SD, you could put a micro SD card in there and, and you could do some data logging to that. So you can actually write data to that SD card, um, which is one of the reasons why it's there. And then finally, we come down here to the wiring diagram. Now, this the wire diagram here isn't really that that useful, to be honest, because it's just kind of showing you the terminals. Now, you will have to do some wiring to you, this PLC, because, because when I give it to you, it's going to be basically in a box, and you'll have to actually wire the power supply to it, because you got to get power to the PLC to turn it on, and it takes 24 volt DC power to energize it. So um, you can't just take the PLC and plug it right into the wall like a home computer. Uh, you have to, um, you know, you have this, you'll have a power supply. That'll be what's going to the wall, 120 volt AC, the wall outlet. And then you'll have to wire from the power supply to 
the PLC, the 24 volt part. So you get a little, you'll get a little practice wiring to the PLC in addition to the, do the programming, which is also uh, pretty important. But this, this diagram here is, is just, again, doesn't really give you how to wire it. It just tells you what the terminals are. And what this refers to is back in this picture, uh, this green row of terminals at the top, that is actually this. This is the top row of terminals. And what you can't see kind of because of the angle of this picture is there's another green strip exactly like this, but underneath here in the bottom. And that is this row of terminals. So there are 16 terminals on the top and 16 terminals on the bottom. The top row is basically your inputs. So all your inputs to the PLC would be wired on the top. And on the bottom are your outputs. So all your outputs from the PLC are on the bottom. The other thing that's on the bottom is the power. So the first two pins on the bottom row is your 24 volt DC power. So the plus and the minus 24 volt DC. So um, again, don't worry too much. I'll, I'll help you here or I'll show you that. Uh, because again, I, I don't want you if, you, if you, if you screw this up and you, and you cross the 24 volt DC, you, you know, you could, you could zap the, uh, the power supply on the PLC itself. So I will, I will help you. We'll, we'll how to exactly make this connection proper. It's again, it's two wires. It's, it's not hard to do. Just, we really want to be careful and make sure that the, that the plus 24 volt DC from the power supply goes to the plus terminal and the minus 24 volt DC from the power supply goes to the minus terminal. Um, that's basically um, it in a nutshell. So plus to plus, minus to minus. But if you accidentally cross them, you know, you could damage the, the product. Um, and the rest of this is, you know, just kind of some specifications. So a much deeper set of specifications than what was on that um, previous document we saw. So you just, you can kind of, you know, scroll through this document and just kind of see, um, you know, the various, so they give you things like the, you know, the uh, environmental specs, like the, uh, the uh, temperature, um, the temperature ratings and stuff and, and whatnot of, of the product. Um, oh, here's the, uh, so yeah, the relay output specifications. So um, yeah, so it should give you current there too. Oh, here we go, current. So if, it's, if you're switching 24 volts, it could be one amp. Um, if you're switching 120 AC, it could be up to 15 amps uh, for a make 1.5 amp for a break. So, so again, you, you come here to really, you know, see your specifications if you're kind of designing this thing again from scratch. And the last part I want to show you, at least for tonight, will be the user manual because the user manual and this is a 200 so if you notice each one of these kind of grew right this was two pages this was 24 pages this is 200 pages right so you don't have to read and go through this entire user's manual but just know that if you're really trying to figure something out um and, and you you like to kind of you know figure things out on your own um this is really the book you want to come to because it's going to cover a lot of different things, right? It's going to cover the hardware overview. It's going to cover how to install it. It's going to cover how to wire it, communications, program, security, right? So lots of different things in this book. But the most important thing to, to know in this book is this chapter four, which is the wiring your controller part. Because if you come to this chapter, and we scroll down a few pages, we will get a much better wiring diagram. So here is that thing we just saw a minute ago with the terminals. But now I get an actual real wiring diagram. But the only thing to be careful here is to know that, to look at uh, anytime you see any kind of technical manual from any manufacturer is make sure that it is really the wire diagram for what you have. And in this case, this is the 20 AWB and the 20 
AWBR. Well, the A stands for the for AC. So this is not the guy that we have. We have the um, we have the the uh, QWB. So if we so if we keep scrolling, we will find that a couple pages down, we now have the 20 QWB. So this is the wiring diagram that we would want to use to wire the PLC that we you know that we have you know available here in the in the lab. Um, so again, they 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 show the top terminals and the bottom terminals, and we know the top terminals are the inputs and the bottom terminals are the outputs. But the first two are the power. So here's our plus twenty four volt. This is our power supply, um, external power supply. So the 20 plus 24 volts comes to pin one and the negative 24 volts go to goes to pin two on the bottom. Uh, and then if you, uh, I, we do have a couple of switches that we can, um, you know, if you want to try to wire up some inputs, you can definitely do that. And uh, basically the switches would be uh, you know, the same 24 volts plus and minus, you'll put the plus through the switch and then into the PLC and then out of the PLC back to the negative. So it kind of makes a, a circuit internally. So positive 24 volt DC goes through this. This is a push button symbol. So if this, if this was a, um, you know, like a push button wired, you would bring plus 24 volts to the push button. Then I press the push button and that sends 24 volt DC to this terminal six. When the push button is not being pushed, then no power is passing across this terminal or across that contact. And that means there's no volt, there's no voltage at pin six. So the way how the PLC works is basically like right now, when this push button is not being pushed and there's no voltage being, you know, passed across those contacts, that's zero volts on that pin six. And therefore that is considered an off or therefore a zero in the PLC. And then when I press this push button, that will now pass 24 volt power, right? Will flow through that contact and 24 volt DC will now be present at this terminal. Inside the PLC, it recognizes that voltage um, change it it sees it go you know it, it, it detects 24 volts so now the plc considers that as an on so when it sees 24 volt dc it's on therefore it's a one if it sees zero volts it's off therefore you know it's a zero so that's how the plc really interfaces the real world physical devices and kind of virtualizes it shall we say inside the plc so um that's kind of why we wanted to make sure you know we covered all these discrete devices here because you know these are the things that actually get wired up to the plc and you know again discrete we talk about all these discrete inputs and outputs you know discrete in that respect always means on or off and um we need to know the voltage that the plc can handle because this is a 24 volt DC input. If I were to put 120 volt AC on here, not knowing, and now I got 120 volts AC going to this terminal when it's only expecting 24 volt DC, well, we're going to basically damage, right, that input. So that's why, you know, it's important to know what our voltage is. And again, if it's a discrete or analog input, all right. So no analog inputs that we're worried about right now. We're not going to, we're not really, you know, the first couple of labs we're going to do, we're going to be just kind of some, just, just some basic discrete kind of control. And then we'll kind of, you know, as we go, we'll, we'll, we'll continue to kind of add some complexity and we'll add some analog things in there as we go. So um, any questions on that? Yes, sir. All right. Um, starting to kind of, click maybe a little more hopefully um the uh yeah so let's just plan on monday night come out 
to City Park campus. Uh, I'll send you an email again to confirm, but Building 22, if you're not familiar, if you're not familiar with the City Park campus where Building 22, you kind of pull in the parking lot by on Navarre, right by the WYES studios is our built is the Building 22. And um, kind of, um, and I'll send you some details on the room that we're, I'll be in. So, uh, and then I think probably next Wednesday night, we'll meet up again like this. And I will uh, take that time to really walk through the, uh, the actual kind of how to get started with this thing. And then you'll be on your own to start doing some, some programming exercises and uh, let you start getting your feet wet finally. Uh, that's really the way to learn. So I could talk forever and ever and ever, but really these are the kind of things where just doing it is going to be the, the way that you learn um, best. So, so we'll take baby steps first and then we'll get, you know, as we go through the semester, we'll, we'll get a little, we'll get a little more complicated as we go, but baby steps for the first few ones. All right. That's probably all I got for tonight, unless you have any questions or if, um, if anybody has any questions on anything up to this point, feel free to ask or always you can feel free to email me anytime and uh, I'll try to answer if you got anything in particular. But I appreciate everyone joining and um, so uh, if there's no other questions then we'll close it out and uh, get on with our evening. Sounds good. All right, guys. Yeah, All right, have All a good right, weekend. Yep. Sure. Bye.